Today's Old Testament reading leaves Abraham and the patriarchs far behind. We fast forward 400 years and find the Israelites still in Egypt, but under very changed circumstances. We learn that during the course of those four centuries, Joseph and all he had done for Egypt was forgotten. The Hebrews have multiplied and become a powerful force, and the new Pharaoh finds their strength intimidating, a potential threat. He sets them to work at hard labor, making bricks and building storage cities. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied. Finally, he tells the Hebrew midwives to kill every infant boy that is born to a Hebrew woman. But the midwives deceive him and surreptitiously spare the newborns. At last, Pharaoh issues an edict to the people at large. Every male child born to the Hebrews should be thrown into the Nile and drowned. And now the focus in Exodus narrows down to one Hebrew family. We learn in subsequent chapters that the wife's name is Joshebed and her husband was Amram, both born of the tribe of Levi. And as we will learn later, a son and a daughter had already been born to this couple, Aaron and Miriam. But now Joshebed gives birth to her last child, Moses, already a beautiful boy even in his infancy. She can only keep him in hiding for three months, and then she creates a little boat out of reeds and pitch and bitumen and is forced to abandon Moses to his fate on the shore of the Nile, hidden in the bulrushes, while his sister Miriam watches at a distance. Today we're going to look at just a few images of this event, but each one tells us as much about the society and culture that created it as it does about the biblical event itself. I found the differences quite revealing. Here we see an absolutely fascinating image, the earliest Judeo-Christian art in existence, which comes from a synagogue in Syria on the Euphrates River in a place called Dura Europas. It was a fortress city founded by a Macedonian Greek ruler who named it Europas after his own birthplace, but the Hebrew people who lived there called it Dura, an Aramaic word meaning dwelling, enclosure, or fort. So now it is called Dura Europas. The synagogue was built and decorated around 244 AD, but Dura Europas itself was founded much earlier during the Hellenistic period. This was a period during which populations moved around quite a bit and various cultures intermingled and cross-fertilized with one another. Dura Europas was no exception. Being in Syria on the banks of the Euphrates, it saw more than its share of itinerant traffic and trade, and over time became a melting pot of different cultures. The region had been under the domination of Greeks, Parthians, Romans, and Persians, in successive waves. The synagogue attests to this variety of influences. To begin with, we normally think of Jewish architecture as being without images of any kind, in strict observance of the second commandment, thou shall make no graven image. Yet here we have a whole array of images throughout the synagogue, and particularly on the west wall, the wall toward which the worshiping congregation would face, which was thus the focal point of their worship. Apparently, the images functioned as a visual interpretation, or midrash, of the high points of the Old Testament, narrating the most important stories of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, plus the exploits of Moses, Joshua, King David, and others. Just as in Christian churches much later, the images served as a Bible for the illiterate. The very fact that there are images at all suggests that Jews here were very open to the influence of the surrounding culture. 
We'll talk more about that in a moment. But now let's focus on the lower right-hand corner. Here we see Pharaoh dictating his orders to a scribe on his left and another assistant, perhaps a herald, on his right. Spread the word that all Hebrew boys should be cast into the river and drowned. Pharaoh here is dressed in the style of Persian royalty rather than Egyptian reflecting the style of the latest occupiers. In the next frame, we see Moses' mother placing the basket with Moses in it into the Nile, and behind her are two women. Since in their attire, they are the double of the two women on the far left who are holding Moses, we can assume that these two women are Moses' mother, Joshebed, and his sister, Miriam since, as we shall soon see, they are the ones allowed by Pharaoh's daughter to nurse and raise Moses while he is an infant. Many early Jewish commentaries, the Midrashes, identified the two midwives named in Exodus, Shifra and Fua, as being alternative nicknames for Joshebed and Miriam, which would make sense since we see them being given orders by Pharaoh's assistant on the right to kill the Hebrew boys, and then appearing in the same outfits on the left, as Moses is given back to them to raise. Forgive me if you hear a little thunder and rain. It's, it's absolutely tipping down outside. But let's move on now to the middle panel. Once again, we are far removed from normal Jewish practice here. This panel shows a naked daughter of Pharaoh rescuing Moses from what appears to be a small wooden boat. And indeed, Jewish tradition normally did not conceive of Moses as being in a basket, but rather as being in a vessel that resembled something like Noah's Ark, as we see here. Now, it's never shocking in Greco-Roman culture to see nudity featured, but it is almost unheard of in Jewish culture. So, once again, we see signs that this outpost of the Jewish diaspora has happily integrated another custom from its pagan neighbors into its iconography. And who are the three women behind Pharaoh's daughter, holding a variety of objects? According to the scholarly opinion I read, they are a group of three divine nymphs whom Hellenistic tradition believed appeared at the birth of kings or divine beings. They are seen elsewhere accompanying the birth of Dionysus, Alexander the Great, and King David. They're dressed in a Greek-style peplum, which is a sort of tunic that covers their upper body. They hold in their hands their characteristic attributes, the bowls with the imprint of a scallop shell, and a ewer of water, all for assisting in the birth and bathing of the newborn. And the nymph in the middle holds a small casket or gift box to be bestowed upon the newborn king. Now, do I think that the Jews of Dura Europis actually believed in the presence of three divine Grecian nymphs at Moses' birth? No. Not any more than I think they believed that Pharaoh wore Persian robes. But this was the most recognizable way they knew to convey both the unique importance of Moses' birth and the fact that Pharaoh was a royal presence. As you can see, according to this tradition or midrash, Pharaoh's daughter herself enters the water to rescue the baby. She does not send one of her retinue to do so, as we read in our account of the passage. Now if we move on to the last panel, reading right to left, as was standard practice for Jews, we see Miriam and Joshebed entrusted with the baby by Pharaoh's daughter, who gestures toward them because Miriam has boldly stepped forward and asked the princess if she would like her to find a wet nurse from amongst the Hebrew women. When the answer was yes, Miriam immediately proposed her mother for the job. The princess agrees to this arrangement, 
and Moses is thus placed back into the hands of his own mother and sister until such time as he is fully weaned and able to enter into life at the court of Pharaoh himself, treated as one of the family. What struck me so forcefully when I first began looking at this image is how the emphasis is placed squarely on the role women play in this event. After reading Genesis and the stories of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and his 11 brothers, you could be forgiven for thinking that women played an almost non-existent role in Jewish life. Therefore, I was stunned and pleased to see this gathering of heroic, clever, and independent-minded women on the walls of a synagogue, no less, acting on their own, all in a deliberate refusal to abide by the cruel edict of Pharaoh. And I would include Pharaoh's daughter in that number. And I'm grateful to these Syrian Jews who felt free enough to express their love of scripture in this way, carrying on the collective memory of their people's history in images that speak to us today. The images tell us not only their version of the biblical tale, but also allow us to see how that tale is told by incorporating elements of the surrounding cultures and tribes in whose midst they lived. What a difference then to move forward in time to say the 17th century, when once again, this image was very popular. One of the reasons for its popularity was the philanthropic movement to create foundling hospitals for abandoned children, such as we see in Brunelleschi's early Renaissance rendition of this institution. This is called the Hospital for the Innocents, which led to a revolution in Italian architecture. Here I show you only one wall of the gracious exterior with its colonnade and spacious arches. Each arch is crowned with an image of a foundling child. These uh, tondos were subsequently created by the Della Robbia workshop in blue and white glazed terracotta. Some of these foundling hospitals had been funded by generous patrons who frequently commissioned a painting of Moses saved from the Nile as a suitable subject to grace this kind of institution's walls. It became a very popular subject during the 1600s as it allowed the painter to feature a river scene, beautiful exotic women, and a cherubic little baby boy. The first painting we look at was not done for a foundling hospital, but expressly as a gift for King Charles I of England by Orazio Gentileschi, father of a daughter whose work now outshines her father's in terms of its notoriety and originality. I speak of Artemisia Gentileschi, whose work has recently been featured in a blockbuster show at the Royal Academy in London. But Orazio was highly esteemed at that time, and this painting of the finding of Moses is Orazio at the height of his powers. He was known for his skill in painting gorgeous fabrics and draperies, and we certainly see him displaying that skill here with the shimmering silk gowns. Only Joshebed and Miriam on the left appear in rather simpler garments. The Egyptian princess in the sumptuous yellow and ivory gown wearing an intricately wrought crown is a study in elegance. The maidens surrounding her provide perfect foils. They do not compete with her gown, but rather complement it in subdued shades of shimmering blue and mauve. And in case the viewer is puzzled as to where he or she should be looking, the pointing gestures of Miriam and the princess let us know that it is the little baby in the basket that is all important. Their hands come together at the exact center of the picture, while the light coming in from the left and the interchanging glances of the women moves our eye in a circle, all 
all around the critical image of the baby. I guess I don't need to tell you that Orazio is not even pretending to suggest that these lovely ladies look or dress like Egyptians. All of the women, aside from the more humbly dressed Joshebed and Miriam, are dressed in fashions that would have been very much at home in the court of Charles I, which is exactly what the artist intended. The Flemish painter, Cornelis de Vos, has arranged his pictures in a very similar way, excuse me, arranged his figures in a very similar way, although he has them arranged from low on the left to high on the right, whereas Arazio starts high on the left and moves down on the right. No matter, each painter makes the women a tight group around the child and the rest of the painting, beyond the diagonal, becomes rather generic landscape. De Vos also creates a similar circular movement for the eyes of the viewer to follow, from the light on the maiden's shoulder on the left, all the way around to Moses, and then back to the original maiden. De Vos, like Orazio, is concerned with giving his beautiful women courtly costumes, although the princess in the ornate gown, gown of red does not receive a crown. And just like Orazio, de Vos has the princess's gesturing hand at the intersection of the diagonals at the center of the picture. De Vos was a native of Antwerp, which for a long time had been a major commercial center of trade. With all the countries of Europe, as well as with Brazil and the Far East. The parrot featured on the right attests to this trade. It was not unusual for wealthy families to have a parrot as a pet. And here it serves as a sign both of extreme wealth and of faraway places. De Vos must have hoped that faraway Egypt would spring to mind, as nothing else in the painting suggests it. The French painter, Nicolas Poussin, painted the scene of the finding of Moses at least three or four times. This was his last version. He evokes a different atmosphere than the other 17th century painters we've seen, and even manages to introduce a pyramid in the distance. He also draws on a different source for his historical material. Josephus, the Jewish historian, says that Pharaoh's daughter sent one of her swimmers, presumably a male, to fetch the child, whose basket must have drifted into the river. That is why we see this well-muscled young man handing the basket to one of the princess's attendants. Poussin is clearly trying to achieve an atmosphere of perfect calm in this landscape of the placid river whose water is so still that it perfectly reflects the arches of the bridge and the sky and the clouds above. There are a number of vertical and horizontal lines created by the water, the bridge, the fishing boat, and the standing figures. And this in itself lends a feeling of solidity and calm. And as is always the case with Poussin, there's a careful mathematical calculation being made throughout, giving the painting its feeling of balance. The princess herself, regal in yellow, stands apart from the action, leaning on a servant, while gesturing with her extended arm and hand toward the basket and Moses. Drawing the diagonal down from the upper left corner, we follow the princess's arm over the shoulder and along the extended arm of her servant girl, directly onto the important figure of Moses. As in the other paintings we have looked at, her hand pointing is at the exact center of the painting. Using the rule of thirds, we see that the princess stands along the left vertical line. 
while her head and neck appearing in the light at the juncture of the horizontal and vertical lines, and the head of the servant, who is picking Moses up, is at the intersection of the right horizontal and the right bottom vertical lines, nicely picking up two prime centers of interest. Poussin has also balanced out the composition by including a, a rather gratuitous male figure on the left, a personification of the River Nile, complete with his cornucopia. This is a trope very familiar in Greek and Roman sculpture and all forms of art. Poussin has not followed the other artists in giving his female figures sumptuous, silken, bejeweled garments. He is settled for simplicity and pleasing colors. I rather enjoy his avoidance of ornate display, his choice of simplicity and clean lines over busy opulence. But for me, the end result seems too stiff and static. But perhaps that is what his patron desired, absolute stillness, when he commissioned the picture. You just never know. But now if we jump forward into the 19th and the early 20th centuries, everything changes. We've already seen that Napoleon's conquests in Egypt brought to light a treasure trove of Egyptian artifacts and led to a rage for all things Egyptian throughout the next century. The artist Frederick Goodall visited Egypt twice, once in 1858 and again in 1870. He spent many months there, camping with Bedouin tribesmen, observing local practices, and studying antiquities. In his paintings, which were highly prized, he strove for authenticity. As a good Victorian, he normally eschewed nudity, except where it could be introduced with some pretext of historic plausibility, in which case, bring it on, as he does here. We see accurate Egyptian inscriptions on the walls of the buildings, an accurately rendered statue of a seated pharaoh behind the princess on the right, an ibis beside her, a bird sacred to the Egyptians, and lotus flowers floating in the water at the princess's feet, also dear to the Egyptians, who loved flowers. The princess is startling in her whiteness, but that is probably in keeping with the thinking at that time that the royalty of Egypt was more lightly skinned and that they kept darker skinned people as slaves. We now know there is no proof of this at all, so this is simply a reflection of the prejudice in favor of whiteness during the Victorian period. But you can see that Goodall strove to depict ancient Egypt, its architecture, its plant and bird life, its inscriptions and statuary and mode of dress, just as he had studied and experienced it firsthand in situ, which is quite a change from the preceding centuries. Last, but certainly not least, is this rather amazing painting by Sir Lawrence Alma Tadema, a picture which served to inspire Cecil B. DeMille's Cleopatra and the film The Ten Commandments. Moses has been found and is being carried aloft by the princess's female attendants, his basket heavily festooned with lotus flowers. The princess, holding a flail in her left hand, a symbol of royalty, and a lotus in her right, gazes down on Moses adoringly from her perch on the litter carried by her male slaves. Her feet rest on a footstool decorated with bound captives, another symbol of royalty. And the captives, with their long black hair and beards, are made to recall the enslaved Israelites. She is kept cool by the breeze wafting from fans made of ostrich feathers, which are also wound with lotus flowers. 
it is claimed that one of Alma Tadema's daughters actually served as the model for the princess in this image. Cartouches on the base supports of the two vases indicate that this is the daughter of Pharaoh Ramses II. On the far left is a red granite plinth and the lower legs and feet of an unseen figure, possibly a copy of the statue of Seti II in the British Museum. The inscription on the plinth reads, Beloved of Ra, king of Upper and Lower Egypt. In the foreground, we see a riot of delphiniums, a, a flower popularly used to decorate mummies. And in the background, beyond the river, we see a multitude of men, probably Israelites, hard at work, and we also see several pyramids in the distance. So, if the 17th century paintings we looked at had next to nothing to recall ancient Egypt in a realistic way, here we have so much Egyptology served up that we struggle to take it all in. Perhaps Goodall was right to stick to what might be called the bare essentials. I leave it to you to decide. Meanwhile, I hope to see you all next week and in the meantime, be well, be blessed, and stay safe.